All right. So just starting the, the recorder, uh, for those that'll join online later by YouTube, this is uh, week seven of a Revelation here on Monday night at Berean and online. And have just said that uh, take a break next week for spring break. So we'll come back together in two weeks. And uh, I'm going to let our brother Tommy Smith pray for us uh, as we get ready to start. So, Tommy, I'm assuming that you're unmute yourself. I so, if you would, there. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you well. So, if you would, go ahead. My Heavenly Father, Almighty and all-knowing God. Father God, once again, Father, we come to bow to you, Father. And Lord, Father God, we come to you in no shape, form, fashion, or show. But Father, we come to you, sinners, saved by grace. Father, we thank you for this day, for your grace, your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your ever-loving kindness. We thank you for a day we never seen before, Lord, and a day that we will never see again. Father God, we come praying and thank you for this opportunity to join in this class tonight. We pray that you touch the instructor, that you would give them wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Prepare them to teach your word. At your ask that you open our hearts and our minds to receive your word while it's being taught. We pray that you cast out that which is not true and help us to receive that which is true. Hide your word in our hearts, Father God. Father God, we come praying for the sick and shut in all this land, Father. There are many out there today, Father God, that's sick and afflicted with all types of illnesses and all types of diseases. But Father God, we know that you're a healer. You're able to heal all diseases and all afflictions. And Father, we just thank you today. We come praying for those that are shut in behind prison walls. We pray for the ones in nursing homes and special care homes. We pray for the lost sinners that may not know you today and pardon their sins. Father God, I ask that you just touch their hearts and their minds and help them to come to know you before it's too late. Father God, we pray that this class would be what you'd have it to be tonight. We pray that he was come in the midst of us tonight, Father God, with your Holy Spirit. Let your Holy Spirit speak to us and through us, Father God. What you'd have us to know and what you'd have us to say. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. welcome. You can grab one there. Uh, so again, uh, Vivian, I'll uh, depend on you to let me know if audio is okay. I'm not, uh, last week the external speaker worked okay, tonight it's not, so I'm not using it. And uh, uh, I will keep going, assuming that you're hearing me well enough, uh, unless you tell me otherwise. You sound good, Kurt. All right, thank you. So... As we start tonight, uh, we'll be going through chapters 10 and 11, also into 12. We may not get all of 12, but since we're covering for two weeks, not being here next week for spring break, uh, then we're, we need to get on into chapter 12 as well. So I wanna go ahead and pick up uh, on the on the video, the Bible Project video, just uh, right near the end of eight and nine here, the trumpets, and uh, before before the seventh trumpet, if you look <clears throat> in eleven fifteen, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and so there's an interlude, just like we had uh, before the seventh seal back in chapter seven. There was this interlude. So now with 10 and 11, we've got this interlude before uh, the seventh trumpet. And uh, that's where it's going to pick up here in the video. So let's go ahead and do this. Get a full screen for you. For him. Then John pauses the action again with another intermission. An angel brings the unsealed scroll that was opened by the Lamb. And just like Ezekiel, John is told to eat the scroll and then proclaim its message to the nations. Finally, the Lamb's scroll is open and now we will discover how God's kingdom will come here on earth. 
The scroll's content is spelled out in two symbolic visions. First, John sees God's temple and the martyrs by the altar, and he's told to measure and set them apart. It's an image of protection taken from Zechariah chapter 2. But then the outer courts in the city are excluded and they get trampled down by the nations. Now some think that this refers literally to a destruction of Jerusalem that happened in the past or will happen in the future. But more likely, John's following the tradition of Jesus and the apostles who all used the new temple as a symbol for God's new covenant people. In that case, this is an image about how Jesus' followers may suffer persecution by the nations, but this external defeat cannot take away their victory through the Lamb. This idea gets expanded in the scroll's second vision. God appoints two witnesses as prophetic representatives to the nations. And once again, some people think this refers literally to two prophets who will appear one day in the future. But John calls them lampstands, which is one of his clear symbols for the churches. So this vision is more likely about the prophetic role of Jesus' followers, who are to take up the mantle of Moses and Elijah and call idolatrous nations and rulers to turn back to the one true God. But then, all of a sudden, a horrible beast appears. Let the reader remember Daniel chapter 7. And the beast conquers the witnesses and kills them. But then, God brings them back to life and vindicates the witnesses before their persecutors. And the end result is that many among the nations finally do repent and give glory to the Creator God in the day of the Lord. Now, stop. Think about the story so far. God's warning judgments through the seals and through the trumpets did not generate repentance among the nations, just like the Exodus plagues only hardened Pharaoh's heart. But the lamb, he conquered his enemies by loving them, dying for them. And now the message of the lamb's scroll reveals the mission of his army, the church. God's kingdom will be revealed when the nations see the church imitating the loving sacrifice of the Lamb, not killing their enemies, but dying for them. It is God's mercy shown through Jesus' followers that will bring the nations to repentance. And this surprising claim is the message of the open scroll that John has placed at the exact center of the entire book. After this, the last trumpet sounds and the nations are shaken as God's kingdom comes here on earth as it is in heaven. So now we know how the church will bear witness to the nations and inherit the new creation, but who was that terrible beast that waged war on God's people? And how will the whole story turn out? John will tell us in the second half of the book of the Revelation. All right. And right quick, let me back up because it can do better with, with this. Um, can control this when I go to the poster. I'm not able to uh, because some of this will be helpful for us. Hold on. Nope, not that far. Just hold on. Right, I'm stop it there. <clears throat> So uh, <clears throat> a couple of things on this. I know it would be a little hard for, for you all to see it with the light on. But I pray that you begin to see some of the continuity of the, of the message, even throughout as, as symbolic, as highly symbolic as Revelation is, and as difficult uh, as some of it is to parse and understand. There are some messages that are coming through clearly centered around the lamb when you when we go back to chapter five and 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 keep that in mind there's one point that did not make some of the teachers that i've listened to or studied have and I, I failed to make it but when you have the lamb there in chapter five john's weeping because there's no one to open the scroll and the scroll represents kind of what they've shown here this is this is how god is going to work in this world and this is this is how his people, it tells a story of, in a sense of God's salvation for people. And so John knew that the scroll was good in some way. It was, it was God's plan uh, for earth, and there's no one to open that. And so he weeps. And notice that, you know, this is, there, there's some, you know, witnesses who've gone on before. There's Moses. There's Elijah. There are some of the great uh, heroes of faith like that. No one there in heaven is worthy to open the scroll. So that includes Moses and that crowd. That shouldn't be surprising because there are, there are connections between 
what we're seeing here in Revelation and the rest of the New Testament story. Think of the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they go up. The, Jesus is transfigured, and they see him talking to who? Moses and Elijah. And, you know, then, then the voice speaks and says, what? This is my son. Listen to who? Who, who did he say listen to? Moses? representing the law, listen to Elijah, kind of representative of all the prophets, listen to him. So it's, it's consistent that Jesus as the lamb of God, he says, listen to him. And here we are in Revelation. And the lamb is still center stage. Jesus as the lamb of God. And again, we mentioned in Revelation Jesus as lamb, the diminutive form in the Greek, arneon, used 28 times. Uh, the lamb is the lion in Revelation. The slaughtered lamb, the slain lamb, is the lion. There is no bloodletting lion in, in the sense that we might think of it. So a throne representing what God is going to do. And, and we heard some of the good and bad news right there uh, in the scroll. And we'll go back, we'll go back through that now in chapter 10. So let's go ahead and uh, listen through the text. Uh, chapter 10, and I think uh, we'll probably just do 10 first, pause, let, uh, go over some points and then on to 11. Chapter 10. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was rolled in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders had said, and do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. In the days when the seventh angel was about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat. It will turn your stomach sour, and in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Pause there. Um, so, uh, breaking, breaking some of it down. Saw a mighty angel. And as you begin to hear the description of the angel there in 10, Robed in a cloud, rainbow above his head, face shone like the sun, his legs were like fiery pillar, pillars. Uh, I mean, it can almost sound like a description of, of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not. So, you know, we'll be clear about that. Uh, and it's not unlike even a description of an angel in Daniel in uh, terms like this. But it's not, it's not, not Jesus, not an appearance of him. Two, he's holding a little scroll, and that we comes into play here later. Uh, in verse four, whenever whenever John heard these seven thunders, he was about to write, and here's what: seal it up, and don't write it down. Again, something similar with with Daniel, uh, and at least. Part of what we can understand from that is 
there are some things revealed there that we don't have here. So, you know, something was revealed there in the seven thunders, started to write it down. No, don't write it down. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's that component there. We need to always kind of keep our, our roles in place. God be God. Uh, we are, we are not, we don't know all that God is doing. He's revealed part of it. Even in this revelation, he hasn't revealed. We don't have all of it written down here. So some things transpired we're not aware of. We don't know about. But onto the bigger picture of God, of course, it's like he says in Isaiah 55. What is it? You know, 9, 10, 11 there. My ways are not your ways. Neither are my thoughts your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't strive to, to know God better. First Corinthians 2, Paul tells us it's by the Spirit of God. It's only by the Spirit of God that we can know the mind of God. So we, of course, have to be seeking for the Spirit to help us to know God better, but we're not going to know some of revelations that he has or his purposes of how he's working and why he's working things out the way that he is uh, as we go through, you know, some tumultuous changes in our own society. Of course, pandemic is, is up into things uh, globally, uh, but you know, uh, even uh, political transitions and all, and can be concerned about the development or direction of some things. We, as people of God, we don't need to be losing sleep over that. God is still sovereign. Uh, regardless of what is happening. It doesn't mean that we're not involved, that we don't, you know, speak up as we can. We do all of it in a Christ-like way, but always kind of take the Psalm 4610 to heart. Remind ourselves daily, be still and know that I am God. You are not God. The government is not God. Remind, be still and know I am God. And that will, it's even that, you know, certainly the, the net effect on John as he saw all of this, uh, curtains are pulled back and, and he sees, you know, the Roman, the Roman Empire may have put on a good front with military might and wealth, but when you peel all of that back, there's, there's rot and there's evil behind the scenes. And John was reminded, God is God. No government system is God. No government system is the kingdom of God here on earth. And we have to constantly remind ourselves of that. So I just, I think it's helpful to us. Don't write it down. Some things uh, we don't know. We're not, we're not privy to even in this hard to understand revelation. Uh, and then the angel, verse five, I'd seen standing on the sea and the land, uh, just simply signifying, you know, all of the earth, land and sea, encompassing, encompassing all of it, uh, swore by him who lives and who created the heavens and the earth. That's one reason why there's no, there's no question. It's not Jesus. Jesus is part of the creator, you know, the creator God uh, swears by, by the creator. There will be no more delay. Uh, verse 7. The seventh angel is about to sound a trumpet and the mystery of God will be accomplished. Uh, so we are going to see some of that as we get into here. And, and in a sense, you can say, wow, it's not really good news. It's bittersweet. As he says, you go, go on to verse 8. Take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel. So I went and asked him to give me the little scroll. He says, take it and eat it. And of course, Mackie mentioned there uh, it's similar to, uh, you know, Elijah doing it. Both Jeremiah and Elijah both uh, are given a, a scroll, the words of God to eat. Now, they were missing one component that John experiences here. With Jeremiah and Elijah, they ate it, it sweetened their mouth, but it didn't make their stomach sour. You know, that added element here, take it and eat it, it'll turn your stomach sour, be sweet. So yeah, 
Verse 10, I did that. Taste the sweetest honey in my mouth, but when I'd eaten it, my stomach turned sour. And you must go and prophesy. So significance of that, well, may not know for certain, but one, as it plays out in the story, at least one application of it seems to be as God unfolds his plans and purposes, it is going to involve suffering. So knowing that God's at work bringing salvation to earth, that's good, that's sweet. So, you know, in that sense, uh, you know, the word of God, the sovereignty of God is, is a good, sweet thing to us. But if we're told, but you're going to suffer, you're going to suffer for a while, then that would be something like, you know, you know, indigestion. That, that's not as sweet to hear that. And we got to know it applies to us. I mean, we just covered it in our in our Peter class. So keep your finger there and just see how well scripture, you know, how well it syncs with itself. Keep your place there. Turn back to first Peter. Um, you know, we could take our pick. There's several uh, places, but in first Peter four. Uh, he said, so first Peter four, one, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. So this is the slain lamb. This is Christ. He suffered in his body and Peter, and they saw the crucifixion. So here's the slain lamb suffering. And he says, you need to have the same attitude that you will suffer. Uh, keep go on down. Uh, look at look at verse twelve. So, dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. So here's Peter, you know, through the Spirit, reminding them, uh, yes, you're going to suffer. And this was just some years before John gets this revelation. So the Christians were already suffering. Uh, and, and he tells us in, in 15, if you suffer, don't let it be because you've done wrong. You know, he mentions the bad stuff of murder, but he also mentions don't be a meddler. Don't suffer because you uh, meddle. Look at verse 19. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to the faithful creator. So just in numerous places, and that's, that's just a few in chapter four. It's there in three. It's there in five. So turn, turn on back to Revelation. But this, it synchronizes with what we're told. It, it, it's corroborated by the, the full weight of Scripture, the testimony of Scripture. Uh, because what we're fixing to see, and they explained it in the video in chapter 11, that with all the imagery, it's saying God's people are going to suffer. And don't we remember back in 6, just, just turn back a few, a, a page or two. To chapter Revelation chapter six, uh, the people of God who had suffered, you know, who had been martyred, that were witnesses. There in verse ten, chapter six, verse ten, they called out in a loud voice, "How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, till you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood?" They were each given a robe, a white robe, or told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Till this number was filled of those who would die for the sake of Christ. And so that is happening. That is what we see continuing to be revealed here in chapter 11 when they're trampled by, uh, as we see here, the uh the powers on earth but behind it of course are the are the dark dark powers so we can go on into 11 unless there's question thought reflection there in 10 10 and 11 work together it's this intermission before the seventh trumpet it's not well, or david go um, ahead it's going to be a little different is it a that's going to be a little different our suffering when you when talk about the murders and all that. Um, is there uh, you know 
talking about the suffering of, of the um, murder. And oh, there in Peter. Yeah, in Peter. Yeah, yeah. He he just there in back where we read, and David was just asking, you know, uh, you know, suffering. And of course, some suffer to doing wrong, and I think that's just Peter's point. Uh, suffering is part and parcel with our existence here. And he says, just make sure that you're living holy lives, that you've sanctified yourself, set yourself apart for Christ, and, and that make sure your suffering isn't from doing wrong as a, and then he mentions those, murderer, uh, thief, or a meddler. Someone who sticks his nose or her nose where it doesn't belong. Uh, he says, but no, let it be because you are faithfully following Christ. And so even today, as you know, religious, some religious liberties erode and, and there may be some more opposition come onto the scene. We just arm ourselves. We, we know ahead of time. Uh, it's just Jesus saying to us in John, in this world, you will have difficulties, tribulation, but don't lose heart. I've overcome. So he gives us the heads up that we need, but it's just that we really in somewhat of a, a little bit of a vacuum in the 2000 year history of the church. There's not been many times where there are places where uh, there has been such an absence of suffering because it's happened. People of God have suffered throughout the 2000 years, certainly in our lifetime today around the world. So as it comes home to us to roost a little bit more, we're prepared. We have the mindset that we need to have, and it is part of the message that he's given us here uh, in Revelation. Let's go on with 11 and keep looking further. Chapter 11. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months, and I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever. Four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, the Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and, and for, for destroying those who destroy, destroy the earth. And God's temple in heaven was open, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. All right. Well, not going to claim to be able to clearly elucidate everything, but again, we're not we're not at a loss. As you know, as complex as it sounds, there are there are some things that we can understand and just notice really beginning kind of 
uh, what we saw there, e uh, 11, uh, 15, 19, especially, that's, we said there are at least four or five days of the Lord in the book of Revelation. One was in six, then eight, and now 11, 19. Uh, I think it's probably accurate to say up to five of them. And so it doesn't mean different comings of Jesus. The day, the day of the Lord, we said each one, it's like the crescendo increases with each one. They become, it becomes even a bit more dramatic, but it's the cyclical nature of the book that he keeps coming back around to some of the same themes that, you know, God will intervene. God does throughout history. We're still awaiting the second coming. But there are times where the Lord has already come and worked and acted in, in human history. So you go back there to start the thought. You go back to 11, uh, the measuring rod, go and measure the temple of God. Well, though some, you know, uh, may think of, he noted, Mackie noted in the video, some may think, yeah, there's got to be a, a literal temple, but... But let's keep in mind, even outside of Revelation, temple of God under Christ is now not Herod's temple. It's not a stone temple. It's what? It's our bodies. First Corinthians 3, 16. Don't you know that your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? So it's consistent to, to understand temple as the people of God. And... Uh, says and to exclude the outer court don't measure it because it's been given to the gentiles well i think it's it's understandable it's it's treating the the text well to say yes there's going to they're going to trample it says the city for 42 months uh well uh, so that is a limited amount of time but that the people of god are going to suffer from powers that be the Babylons of the world that will that will trample them 42 you may read in your notes uh, some will note hey that's the number of encampments that the Israelites had here during their wanderings 42 different encampments but it's a limited time verse 3 I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy uh, then you see in four these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So go back to chapter one. He was real clear saying a lampstand is what? It's the church. You know, these, these churches. So uh, not hard to see that he's saying his church will do this work of prophesying. And remember that prophesying, even with Old Testament prophets, it's like 80% of the prophets is speaking forth the word of God, speaking to the, the culture at the time, to Israel or Judah saying, turn back to God. Uh, a smaller portion of it is foretelling the future, but most of it is foretelling the word of God. So God's church will speak to the culture, the nations around them, prophesy olive trees. And some say, well, that's you know symbolic of the Holy Spirit through working through the, the churches, the lampstands. And you could also, in the seven churches, how many of them did we say just got all praise? Uh, Laodicea had nothing good said about it. It was Smyrna and Philadelphia that had nothing but praise said about them. So I don't, I don't know whether it's a, a stretch or not, but the two lampstands, the two churches that were faithful, you know, that, that hadn't compromised, it's symbolic of the people of God who don't, cave into culture around them and who speak faithfully, you know, for God to, uh, to people, to the culture around us, speak of Jesus. Uh, Do we know what the witnesses were? I think they're used synonymously there. I could be missing something, but there, verse three, uh, Marcus asked, do we know who the two witnesses are? And so verse three, I will give power to my two witnesses. They will prophesy. And then in verse four, he says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. I, I, from what the others that I've read, uh, the witnesses 
the lampstands, these churches, this is the same depicted, you know, depicted uh, here is like maybe two individuals that, you know, kind of uh, embodied by Moses and Elijah again, but that is the role of, of us as the church today to speak. So I think, I think it's a, a fair treatment and reading of it to say the, the witnesses are the lampstands at all. They are the faithful people of God, like the Smyrna and Philadelphia church. Yeah. Uh, go on to seven, because we'll have to keep moving on through some of this. When they finish their testimony, then here appears the beast. And as Matthew says in the video, let the reader think of Daniel chapter seven. Uh, comes up from the abyss and some other teacher has noted, he's always coming out of the abyss. That's because it's representative, it's indicative of the always comes from darkness, always comes from a place of, of, of darkness and, and evil. He comes from the abyss and overpowers and kills these witnesses. So we probably don't need to be thinking of, are there two people in history that this is going to happen to? It's happened repeatedly. That's the whole point of Revelation, that this, this, this cycle of empire opposing the people of God has happened repeatedly. So this the beast, you know, working behind the powers that be. Sure, the face of it may be at the time, the, the face of the beast was wrong, but who's the power behind it? It's just, isn't it like what Paul says in Ephesians 6? Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against what? Spiritual forces of, of darkness in the heavenly places. And same, same thing here, same principle, the face of it's wrong. So today there's different empires, you know, you know, and it's not even, it's not anyone. It's not just North Korea. It's not, it's not just China. It's not just Colombia. Uh, it's throughout in nearly every one of the nations, there are some powers that be that oppress the people of God. Uh, so they kill them, overpower them. Uh, you go look in verse 8, their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Well, we don't need to get too hung up on, well, okay, which is it? Sodom, Egypt, Jerusalem. Again, it's kind of, it's, it's as he said, an archetype of all cities of men that, that began to uh, you know, oppose, rebel against God, beginning with that, you know, the Tower of Babel early on in Genesis, and it's continued through today. So we don't, we don't really need to try to pin that on, you know, well, is it Jerusalem only? Because it was Rome also that participated. It was Rome that gave the Jews uh, the ability to go ahead and crucify him. It's all of these combine uh, and then it talks about for a while you know they three and a half days again a limited period of time it's half of the complete seven so this period of time but verse 11 after three and a half days a breath of life from god entered them they stood on their feet well again we probably don't need to be looking in history okay has there been a time where someone's been raised from the dead and continued prophesying isn't it when we look at the, the overall tenor of scripture, you, you take the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37 uh, and God was showing Ezekiel there, this is what I will do with Judah. I will restore life to them after they have suffered for a while under Babylon. I will breathe new life into them. And so it is even, even today, sometimes, the, the powers that be will overcome the people of God in Iran, uh, terribly oppressed, but the church is growing faster there than any country in the world. So all of these things are happening in countries around us. These principles are being played out, though they actually kill some. And they may seem for a, a period of time to have the upper hand and be winning. There is inevitably a time where God raises his church, others in his church back up, so we don't need to think in terms of 
specific person being brought back to life again and continuing to prophesy. It's the, it's the ongoing church of God. Some are killed. The church raises back up with the spirit of God in them and continues to speak. And ultimately, it is this unveiling. So the key to it, what, what is important for us, God overcomes. Some of the unbelievers here see this earlier, as he said, the judgments of God didn't bring about repentance. But as they see the people of God suffer and die for their message, that is what begins to turn the hearts of some of the unbelievers. So it is following the example of Jesus. It is... It is death in the face of those who oppose God and not with vengeance. It's the way Jesus did. Put away your sword, Peter. My kingdom is not like that. It, it will be the, the love of God's people shown even to the point of death that changes the hearts of people. What does Jesus say in John 13, 34 and 35? A new command I give you that you should love one another how? That's not, that's not new. We've always been told all the way back in the Torah to, to love one another. But even as I have loved you, so you should love one another. How did he love us? You know, his entire being. He laid down his life for us. When we love that way, when we, when we are sacrificed for the cause of Christ, uh, that is what changes the hearts of the people. And that's part of what we're seeing with all of this symbolism and all this imagery. It is telling us that message and we may not want to hear it. So we might go and find another interpretation, you know, to lay over the, to lay over the top of it. But that is undeniably part of the core message of revelation is the people of God suffering in the face of empires, even dying under the boot of empires, but maintaining their faithful witness to Jesus. And that begins to change some. Because you have that, look at verse 15. I mean, it really is kind of an exciting message. It's more relevant to us, I think, than we might realize. Look at verse 15, 11, 15. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, loud voices in heaven, which said, and it's significant what's said here. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and will, he will reign forever and ever. What, what, what is it? Sometimes it's helpful. <clears throat> I find, <clears throat> sometimes I lose my voice. <clears throat> I find it's helpful to say, what is he not saying? So he doesn't say the kingdom of the world was obliterated by the kingdom of Christ. Kingdom of Christ you know, incinerated, obliterated, did away with the kingdom of this world and has started all over. He says the kingdom of this world has become. It has transformed. It's been transformed into the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And it's more in keeping. Stay with scripture. The, the new heavens and new earth scriptures from Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, what we'll see in Revelation 21. It's not, and even Paul in Romans 8, this current creation groans waiting for redemption. So the good news is that the way of Christ, the, the slaughtered lamb does win out in the end. And again, there have been some throughout history who have followed this model. Uh, we mentioned like a, a nonviolent resistance, whether it's Martin Luther King or of course Gandhi before this, that is, they're all very impressed with even Gandhi with Christ himself and his, that's what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount in, in nonviolent resistance and the turning the cheek. And so when the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom Yeah, and so Marcus is just asking if 
what he's saying there in 15, if that means, you know, kingdoms of this earth or, you know, and as well, much as we, that we're, the entire world is trying to fall into our lap. Yeah. And, and we don't have, you know, I, I admit, you know, none of us see this completely crystal clear. God hasn't given us a, a you know, a, a detailed roadmap, but from what we can see and even what we see at the end in Revelation that it seems to be that yes, it is, God is not finished with this earth yet. When the, the four scriptures that talk about new heaven, so we're okay with that, but new earth, new earth, new earth. He's not finished with this earth. And he talks about the, the kingdoms, the powers of this world. It's, you might could use other language and say has been subsumed by, has been, has been taken up into the kingdom of Christ. Uh, you get that picture certainly in Revelation 22, the new Jerusalem, uh, the, the river of the trees of life and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. That kind of messes with some of our typical eschatology because wait, wait, what, what place is there for healing in, you know, in a place where there's no tears or, but those are some of the difficult passages that it seems to argue that yes, that, that where he keeps talking about, you know, God will judge, but his judgment, remember, is not, that's the difference with God. It, his judgment is not for punitive purposes. His judgment is always to be restorative. Now, people don't always respond to it in that way, but God's judgments are always for the purpose of restoring because all of these, the this, this signs, these plagues have been to, for the purpose of bringing people to repentance. But he seems to be saying that, yes, you know, there will be a time where we see that more with Christ and his coming. Uh, how it will look exactly, we do not know. Uh, he says there in verse 16 and uh the 24 elders, so we've seen them seated around the throne. They worship God. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was. You have taken your great power and have begun to reign. So it's there is like his kingdom coming. It's the prayer that we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Father, bring your reign more fully on earth as it is in heaven. And he's indicating to us there is a time where that happens more fully. He has begun to reign in these kingdoms on earth, transformed into his kingdoms. Uh, 18 is kind of a throwback to Psalm 2, and the, the enthronement psalm. Uh, interesting that he included at the end of 18, uh, and for destroying those who destroy the earth, he has something to say about those who rape and pillage the earth. And then God's temple in heaven was open, seeing the covenant, and then the lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. Probably don't need to spend too much of our time here on earth wondering, well, where might the Ark of the Covenant still be? Is it in Ethiopia? Like, you know, some say there, uh, you know, we, we don't, don't need to give too much thought to that. Here we see image, you know, in heaven of this well thoughts observations we we get into we still have some time and we'll need to uh, at least get started into 12 but uh you may have something to add there um i don't think i was going to yes i did leave out one point there in uh, 11, 11, after three and a half days, a breath of God, life of God entered them. They stood up. Uh, uh, you know, they continue their witness in a sense. Think of, I, I reflected back on Jesus in Matthew 16, 18. Who do people say that I am? Peter, you're the Christ. And he says, on this rock, this not, not Peter himself, but on this rock, this knowledge that I am the son of God, I will build my church and the gates of hell, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. 
uh, it's not far-fetched from what he's saying here that even though uh, powers that be may even kill all these people, they cannot, uh, they, they cannot overcome it. And the gates of hell are not offensive measures. Gates are defensive measures. And he's saying, Jesus is saying there, his church will plunder hell, not with sword, not with violence, you know, not with bloodletting, but by laying down their lives, his church will plunder hell and set people free. And I think it's somewhat in keeping with what we're seeing here, the life, the breath of God enters into them, that even in the face of death and destruction from hell itself, God breathes life. And he enables his church to continue faithfully with its witness. Well, we go into 12. Uh, and we'll do video on 12 in two weeks. But let's go ahead. There's uh, it's rich. We'll probably just get part of it. But at least since we're trying to make up material tonight for two weeks, uh, we'll get through a, a good portion of it. So, Chapter 12. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. But the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Then, from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then, the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. And carries right on into, well, that's easy to sort out, isn't it? Uh, no. But you've probably, you know, already heard some reflections on it and, and we can look at it. I think it's, it's right and consistent with the, the text, the fair treatment of, of the text to say, well, we, we can certainly kind of see uh, fulfillment on, on two levels here. We know ultimately the male child that is pointing to is the Messiah, uh, that, that is Jesus. But what a number of teachers will say is don't, don't restrict the woman to being just, you know, Mary only. Sure, there's things that fit about Joseph's and Mary's experience in giving birth uh, uh, to Jesus, but it really isn't restricted to Mary only. We miss part of it. We miss a little bit of the larger story of God's people 
if we if we just zero this in onto Mary giving birth to Jesus, because God's story of getting the Messiah uh, here to Earth uh, involved numerous attempts where the dragon attempted to exterminate the people of God. If you go, if you go all the way back in into the to the garden, and you know. 315, Genesis 315, there's kind of where the enmity begins. Uh, the Lord comes and says, I will, you know, uh, put enmity between uh, your seed and her seed, and it's singular there, and you will strike his heel and he will crush your head. So, you know, what we got to be careful is with the, with the serpent, with the dragon, with Satan, the, the accuser. Uh, he's not omnipotent. He's not God. And we can sometimes give him the attributes of God, but he's not. Uh, so he doesn't know everything, not, not omniscient. You know, he doesn't know all that God knows. He hears there will be one coming who will crush your head. And so you really can see the story playing out, the scarlet thread interwoven throughout scripture and the story playing out of how he tried to prevent that. He finds out later, so he knows it's gonna be seed of the woman. So that's, you know, all humans, but he finds out in Genesis 12, you know, to the promise made to Abraham. Oh, it looks like it's coming through Abraham's seed. I will bless you and make you a great nation. And through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And, and there's this, continuing story of, of behind the scenes. Satan's never mentioned in all of that, you know, through that story. But the Egyptians, the, the Babylon of Egypt, trying to decimate the people of Israel. So chapter 12, this, this dragon trying to destroy the, the offspring, it's not, not just Mary, it's, it's Israel. It's the larger story of the people of Israel and his attempt at a holocaust attempted Holocaust through the Egyptians, attempted Holocaust, when else can you think of? Certainly under uh, Esther, uh, when Haman got the, secured the right to, to wipe out all of the Jewish people, there was another Holocaust attempt. And that's, that's what, that's part of the story. He's pursued this child, you know, uh, yes, ultimately, it is in the person of Jesus and see him jousting with him in the desert, Matthew 4, Luke 4. But so looking, just look back at Revelation 12, a great wonder sign appeared, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. So that's, you know, kind of think about Joseph's dream, where he talked about the sun and the, you know, moon, the stars bowing down. Uh, woman, Israel, the heavenly bodies, another thing to keep in mind in, in studying scripture, Old Testament and New, the, the heavenly bodies are always representative of world earthly powers. Uh, talking about, you know, the moon uh, turning blood red and all these are always the power, the heavens are shaken. We don't have to look literally for the stars to fall out of the sky. This is talking about the powers that be being shaken. 12 stars, you know, the 12 tribes, uh, the dragon appears, 10 horns, you know, a beast. Horns always represent power in scripture, Old Testament and New. 10 horns, so he's very powerful. Uh, tries to, to devour the child throughout the story of the people of Israel. And God, God and they are, there's always a remnant who survives you know, Holocaust attempt by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, mm -hmm. uh, then war in heaven, Michael and his angels. You don't have the angels named very often. We have Michael and Gabriel named. Gabriel was seen more in, in Daniel. Of course, the messenger the angel, Michael, kind of the archangel of God's people. Uh, so, and when this happened in history, we don't, we don't know, you know, losing his place in heaven. Could it be that around the incarnation, the, the birth, death, resurrection, 
you know, could that be part of, because that happened from the foundation of the world. Uh, we're going to, when we get into chapter 13, uh, it's going to tell us the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So we don't need to just think 2000 years ago, but could it be, you know, that that's why the resurrection is so crucial. It, it, it breaks the back of, of Satan still powerful, but not where he was. We don't know for sure this war when he's cast out or say he's not strong enough, hurled down to earth, his angels with him. Uh, and take note of 10, what's the work of the, of the devil? Now have come the salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers who accuses him before our God day and night has been hurled down. And that's what Satan means is the accuser. But is this the same story that shows up in Genesis about the battle between angels and Michael in the Old Testament? Uh, think, thinking of which, where, in where there's a description in the Old Testament, I forget which chapter I'm thinking of Genesis, where he talked about the battle between Michael, um, the archangel, and the archangel called out of heaven. This is not the first place in this story. Yeah, uh, Marcus is just asking where a precedent exactly. for this in the old. Uh, you may have to help me, it could be, could be missing. There's not this, uh, no. It was the one when they talked about how it talks about how the angels uh, that I don't Michael know tried, Michael tried to take over heaven and in Laban's turn the Lord kicked him out. And, uh, and, probably and, wouldn't and all his angels. Okay, wouldn't be Michael kicked out, but I don't know if you're thinking of 10 or where is it? Where is it? Six or 10. I'm not going to go back there just yet. Yeah, the he was angel. A, he, was, he was the top angel over all the fire and resistance. He was the second in command at that. Well, you've got Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, where it's talking about the kings of Babylon and Tyre. And then there's language about, uh, you know, that some say applies to Satan in those. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. There's the case in Daniel where Michael is opposed by the prince, the angel of Persia. Uh, there's not a, there's the place in Genesis where it talks about, you know, uh, the sons of God, you know, having relations with the daughters of men. So there's not specifically about Michael warring and being kicked out. You know, it right there in Genesis, I, I, we just see a little bit of a conflict, and we could look at it some more after after class, yeah. since we're down to just a few minutes. But uh, not in the same way that we see here. This war, there's there's very brief flashes, and the main one that I can think of again is Daniel, mm -hmm. where Michael is opposed by the prince, uh, the angel over Greece. Uh, sorry. Gabriel was on his way, was opposed. Michael came and helped him. Uh, notice there in, in Revelation 12, verse 11. So this is significant. This applies to all of us. Uh, they overcame. This is the people of God. How do they overcome the accuser? Verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They didn't love their life so much as to shrink from death. So there you have it again, the people of God, you know, willing to die, uh, not in killing others, but not as a suicide bomber, but laying down their lives. Greater love has no one than to lay down his life for a friend. So we overcome the accuser relying on the blood of Christ, and also by the word of our of our testimony of what Christ has done for us. And that's significant. We got that that is how they overcome. Rejoice you heavens, verse 12. That he's been he's been lost his place there, but woe to the earth. He's gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he know his time, he knows his time is short. And uh, and we see all kinds of you know in scripture. Uh, warnings about Satan, like we just covered in Peter tonight, First Peter 5, 
uh, be alert because your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion trying to find those he can devour. Uh, so as we come down to our last minutes here, any uh, other thoughts or reflections uh, on this? I think, uh, I think we can be really encouraged. The message there is timeless for the people of God of, of how we how we overcome, relying on the work of God in Christ, his blood, and our testimony in him. That probably will have to come back as we pick up in two weeks and we'll just finish up uh, a, a couple of thoughts. But look at, as a warning to us, as kind of a sobering statement to us, look at the end of chapter 12, verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. And who's that? Those who obey God's commands and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So that would be us still. So whenever we were serving the Lord, living our lives, and, and all of these things happen, and difficulties, but we, we don't have to be mystified as to you know why they're they're happening we have an enemy who hates god hates the people of god mm -hmm. making war against those uh who obey so you know it, it it's not so much those that are disobedient not that they don't suffer too but he opposes those who obey the commands and are faithful in following jesus uh, so, uh, that is the word we live in a world at war spiritually. And when we're dealing with difficulties in our lives, we need to always remind ourselves, we may think it's this person that was sent to make our lives miserable, but there is, there are, there's a dark power at work behind, uh, these people or even institutions which we may, again, see more of uh, in, in our own country. Well, if there isn't uh, anything further, we will stop there for tonight. And uh, we'll be, again, wrapping up a few thoughts probably in two weeks, but uh, carrying on. So we're blessing and keep you till that time.